This week on Writers Inc. If you you know you enjoyed the storytelling process so much that you want to try your own hand at it, then you got to find out what's most important to you from your life. And and I, I talked about this recently to a group, and I said I, I think a good way of doing that would would be journaling. You know, keep a journal for a while and just write about anything. It doesn't have to be important. That's the thing. And, and I think that's why journaling is 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 a great idea is it doesn't have to because I think people who journal and I could be wrong, they don't write about big things all the time. A lot of times it's just about what they had for lunch or what they saw when they were on break at school, you know, or 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 if they're a teacher or a student or whatever. But I said, I think if you do that and you write honestly, and that's your goal, so you just write honestly every day for a couple months, I think you'll find something, you'll find stories in there. J.K. Rowling was nearly homeless when she wrote the first Harry Potter book. Stephen King penned Carrie in a small desk wedged between a washer and dryer. James Patterson worked in advertising and famously crafted the Toys R Us theme song long before becoming an author. Join New York Times bestseller J.D. Barker and a panel of industry powerhouses as they pull back the curtain on some of the world's most prolific authors. Where do they start? What is their process? The biggest names in publishing all have origin stories. All have tips and secrets. What does it take to consistently top the bestseller lists and become a household name? Get your notepad out. School's in session. This is Writer's In. Hi, it's Christine Daigle. Patrick O'Donnell. J.P. Reinflush. Kevin Tomlinson. And I'm J.D. Barker. Welcome to Writers, Inc. Kevin, you've got some news for us, right? I do. I do. And uh, no, most people probably don't know this, but just before we record this show, I also record the uh, Self-Publishing Insiders Live with draft digital uh, And today, the last five minutes of the show, uh, I had a little bit of an announcement to make. I let the entire world know that as of tomorrow, October 13th, uh, that will be my last day at draft to digital so saying farewell after seven you know wonderful years he corrected wonderful lengthy years <laughs> wow congratulations yeah, well, so, let's try to yeah. relive the moment so when you're when you're walking out of the convenience store and you scratch off the lottery ticket and realize that like, you actually won was the draft to digital decision the first up. thing that popped into your head <laughs> <laughs> Yeah. So long, number Happy two. Birthday. I'm looking out for number one. <laughs> hey, and it's Kevin's yeah, birthday it was, today. So a hearty happy birthday. It is to my Kevin. birthday. Oh, thank you, Patrick. Happy thank birthday. you. Yeah. Don't sing. We'll have to pay the royalties on that song. We don't want that. <laughs> yeah. Sweet. Jeff will just turn it into a ringtone. So, so you know. <laughs> yeah, this has been a yeah. hell of a weird week. This is, yeah, I, yeah. I right. bet. I mean, do you do you feel good about this? Are you a little nervous? I, or you- I feel both good and nervous. It's a, a. I'm leaving for very good reasons. I got some things coming. Uh, will uh, will be announcing. I'm actually because I'm on this show. This show will get to announce uh, something that's coming up uh, around uh, November first ish. Um, but I've also got. To, I've had some things kind of brewing on the side anyway for years. I've been, I've told I've never made a secret of the fact that I I've never had to work for Draft Digital. I always worked there because I I like the company, I like the people, and uh, I'm, I like serving the author community. It's just been part of my mission for for the past decade or so. Uh, I'm just you know at this point I'm uh, after seven years of of doing this work, I I've kind of run up against a wall of, of growth. I feel like there's more I can do, and they're not able to accommodate some of what I want or need uh, at this point so it's just i think better for me and d2d and for the author community uh, for me to kind of step out of the role and and into something new and i intend to do some stuff with them in the future if they're willing uh and they seem to be uh there's some ideas i have that i think are going to make great partnerships and stuff so it's not the last of me there but i'll always promote the place i'm a a big fan of d2d always have been Cool. Well, congratulations. I yeah. know it's not easy to step out on something like that, but it's usually scary. You know, one door closes, <laughs> another one opens, and it, it's probably a you know, something something bright in the future. Yeah, I think so. Oh. All yeah. right, JP. Speaking of bright future, what's in the news? Yeah, not terrible. It's things. always cheery. I mean, so. some of them are. But <laughs> it's always so cheery, you know. First off, uh, we have our co-op bookstores, the future of book selling. Uh, so bookstores are exploring a co-op business model uh, as a way to kind of empower their employees um, and uh, offer ownership opportunities, kind of democratizing the whole de- decision making of it. Uh, co-ops like Red Emma's in Baltimore are worker owned, while Rosie Bound in Boston are also 
community members, buying shares and voting for uh, certain rights. Uh, transitioning to a co-op uh, obviously has challenges, uh, like unlearning top-down management styles, but uh, it's it's kind of interesting um, because it really brings bookstores into more of a community focus. Um, some argue, of course, that independent uh, shouldn't mean bookstores are isolated from each other, um, but that they should encourage that solidarity, solidarity and connection within the industry. So I found this article interesting. I think it's a, a new-ish model for bookstores that I haven't heard of before. So when, when we say co-op in this context, like what does that mean? Well, it seems to mean different things. From yeah, what, so it's either worker-owned, yeah. so like the booksellers – uh, and, and whoever the original owner was all owning it equally or having it community owned where they're selling shares to mm -hmm. the community. Ah. Yeah. So there were a couple different models in yeah. that article. Okay. I mean, I, I like that as a, as a concept. I, I, I'd have to see it in action to really be able to gauge whether that model is, you know, something viable or not, I guess. But I, you know, I, I like the idea, especially of like a community owned, uh, it just seems like there's it gives you more opportunity to kind of range outside of what you normally see. Like normally, you know, bookstores kind of run on a theme of sorts uh, when it comes to your management. You know, you go in, you can tell, you know, sometimes it's all about the politics and sometimes it's about some other mm -hmm. aspect of people's lives. But, um, you know, seeing something that that is I think this would open up a lot of doors for more diversity in this uh, arena as well. Yeah, it, it's tricky to run a business with with multiple owners. It, I don't know if any of you have ever tried that, but like I've, I've owned businesses with other people, and you know it, it starts off fantastic. But like you have you have to lay out absolutely everybody's responsibilities. They have to yeah. be totally clear. Everybody's got to know where they fall on the little you know pyramid as far as decision making goes. Um, you know, the, the second you don't disagree, you know, you have some type of disagreement. You know, heads heads clash. And if you don't have the yep. infrastructure in place, like a, that pyramid can come tumbling apart very, very quickly. Um, I, I, I do see some benefits to it. I mean, every local business or bookstore that I know, you know, it's basically the owner is there, you know, 16 hours out of the day. And then a couple right, of temporary right. employees are kind of in there. So I, at least, you know, in this model, you've got multiple people kind of taking on that workload. Um, I'm not sure that the profit is, is there to, to support a structure like this. And it, it may be, you know, it's, it's hard to say without really digging into the books. Um, but there, there's a reason a lot of these you know businesses are, are run and managed by you know the the actual owner one person um mainly because financially that's the only way you can get it to work once you start divvying up that pot you know in, into too many hands um it's just not a viable entity anymore for for any of them but um who knows it's a you know change is good change is well, good the reason i asked at the head of this what what that meant in context is because the 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 times i've seen something like a co-op business model has been with like uh, these little antique shops and and sort of antique malls where uh, it's all under one roof, but uh, each section of it is owned by someone different. And the mm -hmm. co-op part of it is like all the retail happens at the front, but, um, you know, everyone has their code on their tag or whatever. Um, that If they were going to run it kind of like that, I could see it working. It's, uh, at that point, everybody in there is an individual owner rather than uh, everyone trying to share. You're just share, you're just sort of leasing space. I've also seen that model. Yeah. My friend had a massage therapy business, and he did that same yeah. thing with a bunch of massage therapy partners. Uh, so it, it can work. But yeah, I agree. It's there's challenging. Yeah, just like hairdressers do that. But what yeah. you said. Um, so the the guy who wrote the book, I forget what it was called, like why bookstores are important or whatever, was Danny Kane, and he just did this model with his bookstore, which was interesting the way he did it because it's worker owned. But he retained 51 percent. Um, mm. So he would still, you know, if there's a management decision that needed to be made, he would be doing that. Yeah. And then his seven other employees own a share. But, uh, you know, we talked last week about uh, Agent Laura Zatz had some criticism about the uh, agents buying into their agencies because it was, you know, people who didn't really need to anyway. But what he did was actually loan the money to his workers to invest until they could pay back. So is getting rid of some of that diversity issue. It was a, an interesting article. I encourage anyone who's listening to just read the whole thing if you're more interested in this. But yeah, yeah. but they do the um, the customer ones with like big stores, right? Like, our, I don't know, we have Mountain Equipment Co-op here. I think REI mm -hmm. is the same thing. Like you pay a hundred bucks and you right. can go to the meetings and have a vote if you want, you know? So 
those kind of things. Yeah. Next, Scholastic is under fire for allowing schools to opt out of diverse books uh, for book fairs. So several librarians alleged on social media that Scholastic is allowing schools to opt out of providing diverse books at Scholastic book fairs. Specifically, librarians are claiming that Scholastic has compiled all these diverse books dealings with topics like racism, LGBTQ plus issues and immigration into a separate case that schools can choose not to have at their fairs. Um, critics are arguing that this is enabling censorship and it's promoting the idea that those diverse books are optional rather than essential reading. Um, those accusations are obviously raising concerns about Scholastic's stance on book banning and whether profit is being prioritized over fighting censorship. Oh, this what is a, a fun topic. One. Yeah, <laughs> <laughs> you're welcome, everybody. Yeah, well, we've we've talked about this before. First of all, like there, it doesn't mention ages at all in this this article. Um, so when I hear Schoolastic, I immediately think you know, younger kids. I think right. elementary school. Mm -hmm. I don't recall Schoolastic being involved in middle school or high school. So it makes me go to that that younger crowd, and I could be wrong there. Um, you know, I, I think as a parent, I mean, I've got a six year old who's in school right now. I want to say in what she sees, what she reads, um, you know, I, I want it to be light reading at this point. Like she's just learning how to read, you know, like she doesn't need heavy topics right now. She needs to, you know, I just have something that's in front of her that she enjoys that you know, puts a smile on her face. I think these heavier topics, they need to be at, a, at an older age. And, you know, this is my opinion. Everybody's got different opinions on it. Um, you're going to piss people off one way or the other. Uh, I, I do think there does need to be a way to distinguish you know, whether, you know, like these books need to be labeled, I think, in some way, which we had talked about last time, you know, but nobody's come to a consensus on that. Um, those labels, I think, do need to translate down to some type of system, you know, so the school can either say yes or no based on the needs of that particular school, because, you know, a school in Florida is going to have a very different answer than a school in New York, um, a school in Boston. You know, they're all going to have different responses to this. But, you know, before you can even answer that question, you know, you need to be able to tick off that particular box. So I, I think it's, it, it, I, I see this as a good thing. Schoolastic is making an effort to isolate particular titles, um, you know, giving the schools the opportunity to weigh in and say, yes, we want these. No, we don't want these, whatever it might be. And those decisions should be fueled by the parents of the actual kids that are there. Like it should it should roll uphill, I think, in some general direction like that. Um, that being said, it's still a complete clusterfuck. It's going to be a while before I think anybody <laughs> has a solution if there actually is one. Yeah. Um, but again, Schoolastic, young kids, I, I think they're too young to be even exposed at this point to you know, topics like this. But one thing I would slightly argue or push back against is I remember in, in sixth grade, I read Animorphs and I read Circle of Magic, which Animorphs is well known to be basically anti-war propaganda, more or less. Very heavy stakes. Characters die <laughs> pretty harshly. It's uh, very diverse. It talks about really hard topics. I was reading that in sixth grade. Uh, and that's sort of the thing that I think we kind of forget. There are stories that are geared towards that younger age that are very hard topics that really help people understand certain broader aspects of life. And I think clumping these different topics into basically one singular opt out case is such a problem. So. I don't think that what they did is right. I do agree that there there may be some level of what parents and schools agree on, but I think grouping all of this into one checkbox is such a mess. So yeah, <laughs> yeah I think yeah, I what, agree with that actually. That the, you know it does seem like you're they're trying to make it an easy button for opting out of all of them. Um, as long as they have the ability to opt out of books individually, I don't actually see the opt out as a problem. Um, because, you know, what are we going to do? Are we going to start forcing any anyone, schools, individuals or otherwise, any consumer uh, to purchase something that we think they should purchase? You know, that's where things get really like Atlas Shrug level problematic. Um, but, you know, I do think, you know, I was on, I, you flipped me, uh, JP, because I was I was OK with the uh, the boxing all that up together. Uh, but I think you've made a very valid point by doing that. You really are sort of enabling a blanket, like you, no thought required. I think if you're going to do this, there should be a lot of thought behind it. And uh, whether you're right or wrong, uh, you should, you know, the cost of the, the cost of Liberty is, is that sort of thing. It's, you know, let's put thought into what we're doing, not just, you know, blindly uh, block books or whatever. Um, but yeah, I'm firmly against though, forcing people to buy things that they 
don't want to buy. Yeah. <laughs> no, I mean, yeah. JP's got a very valid point. I mean, it's, you can't just flip the switch on, on all or none, you know, that, that yeah, doesn't make right. any sense either. Um, and if that's where they're at, that obviously that's, that's not going to work. I mean, sixth grade is very different from first grade where my daughter is and, and, and her particular school, those two grades are in the same building. Um, you know, there's only 37 uh, students total in her entire school. So like if they do a book fair, it's all students or none. Sure. Um, you know, there's plenty of elementary schools that are much larger, which would do a book fair, you know, first grade goes and second grade and third grade. Those titles should change, you know, based on that, that age group, you know, as you get older, you're obviously able to, to deal with you know, heavier topics. You're able to think about those topics and understand them. Um, there, there are so many different X factors that need to be placed on, on, on something like this. And we're just not there yet. Right. And I think like JP said, just like the individual kid too, right? There are kids who are really advanced readers in sixth grade and, you know, are more mature than some other readers. So I don't know how you kind of tease that as out, a, but yeah, I agree with you. As a parent and a grandparent, it's like, okay, you should be very active and know what your kids are reading. And if you're not happy with said school or whatever, well, maybe send them to private, send them to a school that you know, mirrors your values, maybe send them to you. I mean, there's, there's different options for you, but there's education money in that is, though, right though. Like, yeah. Oh, there is, there Not is. Everyone can but, afford you know, private like, school, so. What are the trade-offs? But you know, again, parents be involved in with your kids, know what they're reading, know what the school is all about. And if you're not happy with it, voice your opinion or get them out. It's really simple. Just keep 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 in mind, you know, private school, public school, or like a public school is funded by the parents, you know, by the taxpayers, right? You know, which gives them as much of a voice in, in that particular school as as any other. So, you, you shouldn't have to take your kid and hide them off in a corner somewhere to to get them, you know, to avoid exposure to you know one thing or another. Mm -hmm. You know, there, there's better ways I think to deal with that. Yeah. Last in the news. <laughs> <laughs> this um, better be a fun one, JP. JP. Yeah, it's right. not. You, <laughs> you talk about AI. <laughs> Ready, everybody. No AI, surprisingly. Okay. Uh, this one, this one is a bit of an international topic, but India charges novelist uh, Arundhati Roy over a 2010 speech. Uh, so Indian authorities have charged renowned novelist uh, Arundhati Roy over public comments that uh, they made in 2010 about um, disputed Kashmir regime. Uh, so the charge Charges against them um, being a critic of the Prime Minister Modi uh, included provocative speech and promoting uh, enmity between groups. Uh, it followed a police raid on homes of journalists linked to a news site known for criticizing India's government. Ultimately, these charges relating to a 2010 conference where Roy said Kashmir was not historically an integral part of India, um, sparking a complaint. I know this is international news. I know this is an entirely different government. But regardless, I found this interesting, not only because of this sort of uh, attack on, on someone's speech, but it being nearly 13, what, 13 years old speech that this uh, yeah. this person is kind of getting targeted after is wild to me. So uh, I figured that's, it was that's the part that really news. caught me because, you know, that's the, 13 years ago. And who knows? You know, what's happened in the intervening years? We don't know what was said, what was done. And, uh, you know, thank God for, you know, uh, hopefully we maintain things like the you know, First Amendment and the, uh, the con you know, all of our constitutional rights here in the United States, because this could very well be us. We've experienced this sort of thing online with the, the whole, you know, whether you believe that cancel culture exists or not, uh, people are uh, being held accountable for things that they may have written or said decades ago. Um, there's no statute of limitations apparently on offending someone. Uh, but th you know, this is a frankly frightening outcome for, in my opinion, Th just, this entire thing is just, it rakes at my first amendment loving soul is what it does. <laughs> I, I, I offend people on a daily basis. So I can just imagine what kind of stuff I've got in, the, in my, in my bag. Maybe that's it. Maybe I'm just scared crapless that, you know, they're going to dig up the things I said back in like 2008 and I'm going to be sued or go to jail. <laughs> I, well, <laughs> if anything, like the, the one thing I got out of the story is it just shows us what a slippery slope we're, we're really on. You know, yep. freedom of speech only goes so far. You know, this wouldn't happen today in the U.S. That doesn't mean it couldn't happen here 10 years from now. Um, and I think it's important that stories like this are out there, you know, just, you know, so that optic is, is visible and we're, we're aware of it. This episode is brought to you by Autocrit. One of the most value-packed memberships for any author, Autocrit brings you an amazing suite of tools that make it a breeze to plan, write, and edit your books all in one place. 
Autocrit takes you far above standard grammar checking or cookie cutter guidance. Instead, it's like having an experienced editor in your genre watching over your shoulder to help you deliver great writing that keeps your audience trapped in the story. You can even compare your writing style to more than 100 best-selling authors right down to the word level, so you can see what the best in the business do to keep their storytelling clean, clear, and crisp. Listeners of the Writers Inc. podcast can now take advantage of lifetime membership for one single fee. That's right, no renewal fees. Hi, this is J.D. Barker. I've used Autocrit for years, and not only has it improved my writing, but it's been a crucial tool with aspiring authors that I've mentored. Whether you're a seasoned pro or just beginning, it'll help you find your weak spots and weed them out. Give it a shot with your latest project. Trust me, your editor will thank you. Head to autocrit.com slash JD to get your lifetime membership. Big thanks to Autocrit for sponsoring the show. All right, JD, who's up this week? This week we've got Richard Chismar on. He's the former editor of Cemetery Dance Magazine, um, fantastic at writing short stories. He's collaborated with Stephen King on the Gwendy Button Box trilogy, and his latest novel is uh, just released actually yesterday, October 10th. Uh, it's called Becoming the, Booty, uh, Becoming the Boogeyman. Um, here he is, Richard Chismar. All right, uh, I have to ask your second most commonly asked question. What originally sparked your fascination with the dark side, specifically your use of creepy mannequins? Uh, the mannequins, I have no idea. Um, <laughs> you know, other than the fact that I think mannequins are, are pretty creepy, uh, just in general. Um, but I think I think when you put a bunch of them together, it's, uh, you know, it just becomes this this mind warp thing. At least it, it is for me. Um, and in and and chasing the boogeyman, when I wrote about that, I, I was thinking, what what do I need? You know, I know a lot of police officers. I know a couple of detectives, you know. So, yeah, I've picked their brains before and people were hoping that that was a true story, that part of it, but w- which it wasn't. That was one of the handful of things I made up. Yeah. Um, but I was just thinking you know, based on the different things they've told me that, you know, they've, they went into this house, they went into the, this backyard and they found this and that. I was trying to think what, what worked best. And for some reason, instead of a lot of the grisly, you know, freaky stories they told me, I just, I thought, you know what, an entire house set up with mannequins in the bathroom and the living, you know, everywhere is just messed up. So that's what I went with. But as far as the, the original, my attraction to it, it, I, mm-hmm. I think I was just, I just came out warped, you know, I came out, there. <laughs> you know, my earliest memories, you know, I was, I was the youngest of five, you know, back in the seventies uh, and, and, you know, when it was when I was really, you know, a, a child, um, I was born in 65. I'm an old guy. Um, but you know, like regular TV events, like wizard of Oz, chitty, chitty, bang, bang, you know, they were like big family events. You gathered around just like, you know, uh, Charlie Brown Christmas and all that it came on once mm-hmm. a year, you miss it, you were screwed. <laughs> um, but I remember those early things. I was immediately attracted. Everyone was like, oh, isn't the yellow brick road beautiful? And oh, I love the scarecrow and so sensitive. And I was like, man, there's flying monkeys. I, I had nightmares for a month. Yep. You know, the, the, <laughs> the haunted forest with the branches that came and grabbed you. Yep. That was, I love that. Chitty, chitty, bang, bang. I was fascinated with the whole thing. But the the child napper with the, with the, uh, the net, that dude mm-hmm. messed me up for a while. <laughs> um, so there was that instant attraction and, and, and I was, you know, it was, it was a love hate thing. Cause I was scared to death. My mom was constantly saying, we're not going to let you watch this stuff anymore. Cause you know, I was a active kid back then, no video games, none of that stuff. So I'd be out on a Saturday, you know, playing, playing wiffle ball, football, whatever. And come noon, I'd sprint home because it was the start of creature double feature. Um, yeah. on cable. Um, and I had to see those back to back horror films every Saturday from noon to four, and uh, it, it just grew from there. You know, if, if 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 I was at a yard sale and I saw a bunch of comics, I was either going to grab the ones that were like Western comics or scary, mm-hmm. you know, unknown, mm-hmm. you know, those kind of things. I was not going to grab the historical classics illustrated unless they had a cowboy or an Indian on the front or something. Um, yeah. So, yeah, it was just, you know, it was just a natural thing. Yeah. I have to say what you did in becoming uh, the boogeyman with those mannequins, uh, especially that one reveal. That oh, was, uh, yeah. yeah, yeah, in your second book, yeah. And speaking of your second book, uh, since that's coming out, uh, do you mind giving the audience just a little bit about that sequel, mainly the premise, premise before we dive yeah. in? Um, it essentially it 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 opens with, you know, it opens in present day. If everyone remembers the mm-hmm. first book, you know, uh, was set in 1983. Or no, it was at 88, I think. Yeah, there's the book I'm writing now was 1983. <laughs> oh. <laughs> 
between that and post COVID head, I'm like uh, all day I've been, you know, screwing up, but um, yeah, the first book was set in 88 and uh, that the end of it, the epilogue brought us back to the present at that time, which mm-hmm. was 2021, I think. So this book is set in 2023, you know, it's set in the present. Um, I've written about everything that transpired in that first book. And there's been a movie made of chasing the boogeyman. Um, the book hit the bestseller list. You know, a lot of the stuff that happened was true. A lot of it yeah. is true. Hopefully it will be, hopefully there will be a movie, blah, blah, <laughs> blah. Um, but you know, it's, it's kind of made me into like this mini celebrity in that, uh, you know, I was able to, to move to a bigger house, you know, with some property and people know who I am. And with the good came the bad, you know, with the bigger paychecks came the, the people as they often do. Once you achieve a certain level of success that, you know, can, uh, the people, you know, come out of the grass to, uh, to snipe. So there's some, you know, some different groups, some, uh, you know, some anti-violence groups who are not friends with me. There are lots of blogs and bulletin boards saying, ah, Chismar, you know, he made it on the blood of those victims, you know, that, that house he lives in, that's the house that the boogeyman built, that kind of thing. Um, so that kind of sets the tone, you know, I, I'm, I'm happy. I'm a happily married family guy still. Um, Carly Albright still in the picture. Um, my wife takes a bigger role now because she's not my girlfriend anymore. She's, you know, my wife, she's stuck mm-hmm. with me. And essentially the, the opening chapter, uh, something very bad happens, uh, which I yeah. don't want to give away. But the end of the first chapter is the reason I, you know, that the sequel came about. I had no intentions of writing one, but one day I was mowing the lawn, um, true story. And I was not driving yeah. into the pond. And uh, the idea for the first chapter came with the end. The end of the first chapter is a reveal that I hope people will go, holy shit. And mm-hmm. it ties directly to the first book. Um, and that's, that was the idea that came to me full fledged. And that's why I decided to write the sequel. So, uh, you know, it's not a very good synopsis that I gave, sorry about that, but it's essentially, you know, I, I'm in a different place, you know, uh, financially, uh, you know, family wise, everything than that young college, you know, graduate. Um, but Joshua Gallagher, the boogeyman is still very much in my life. He's in prison and, um, you know, uh, he ends up becoming involved in this and uh, there's a little silence of the lambs there. I tried to make sure mm-hmm. there wasn't too much. Um, and hopefully there's a, a lot of the same heart that was in the first book is in this one. You know, I, I tell people the first book was kind of my love story to my hometown and, and my, my, the family I was born into. And, and this one's kind of my love story to, uh, <clears throat> um, you know, my, my wife and my kids um, but also the, the struggle that I think a lot of us creators go through, which is why are we doing it? And yeah. um, why do we continue to explore the, the dark side of, of humanity? And uh, yeah. that's something I wrestle with throughout the book. And, and I try to be really honest about, and you know, I know at times I make myself look like an idiot, but I just tried to be, I tried to be as accurate as I could be. And uh, I, had, I had a lot of fun doing it. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, so this second book is set present time right. and having that story so close to the present what sort of challenges did you face when you were writing now as opposed to uh writing the original when it was set decades before and and kind of setting that tone um you know the, the more obvious ones were just simply you, you know things like i was a whole lot i was i'm at least supposedly i'm a whole lot wiser um you know, I'm, I'm more mature and kind of balanced, but I, I kind of, you know, tip you in kind of early that I'm really not. I am more mature and in some ways I'm wiser, but I'm just so caught up in this story and in this web of, of Joshua Gallagher's that, uh, that, you know, kind of common sense goes out the window at times. And mm-hmm. uh, as the book, you know, envelops, you, you'll see more and more reveals as to far as how, how deep down the rabbit hole I am. Um, and then there were, you know, things like technological thing. We had cell phones this time. We didn't have them back then. And, yep. and we had Google and we had social media plays a huge part of this book as far as, uh, you know, the word getting out and, and, and news being leaked and that kind of thing. Um, but m- mainly it came more from that it kind of internal engine that's inside of me as the main character. It, it, it was more it was just interesting because I was writing it. I was trying to write it from the viewpoint of who I am now. Um mm-hmm. So just like I was then, people say, well, you know, how true could it be once you introduce the murderers and chasing the boogeyman? And I said, I tried really hard to make it as accurate as I could and to be as honest as I could with the reader as to how I thought I would act. 
Um, mm-hmm. I, did, I did not, I did not try to, you know, it, you've read the first book. I, I certainly didn't posture myself as any kind of hero. I poked a lot of fun at myself through the cops and Carly Albright is constantly there to remind me that I'm just a dumb boy. Um, and, and her and my wife are there in this one to kind of do the same at times, but, 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 you know, still with love. Um, but yeah, it was just interesting because I was, uh, you know, instead of being that, uh, 22 year old, I was in my fifties and trying, you know, trying to be as honest as I could again about how I'd be if my family was in danger and possibly I was. And, you know, a, a lot of people saying, Rich, you're not as smart as you think you are. You know, this, this is dangerous. So yeah, that was the biggest challenge is just that, whoa, you know, you would think it would have been easier and, the, and looking back would have been more difficult, but for some reason it wasn't. Yeah. And so you had mentioned before that chasing the boogeyman was intended to be one and done. And mm-hmm. then that idea hit you and you knew where the story was going to go. But I'm curious, like, what was that writing process like going back to a book that you had totally planned on being done with? Mm-hmm. Uh, and now uh, there's a potential for a third book, uh, yeah. if I'm not mistaken. <laughs> yes, yeah. One way or another, eventually. Um yep. Yeah, it was interesting. I mean, I, I I actually had to do like, I had to like create character lists and do all that stuff that, that real writers do. And that I'm usually like, <laughs> hell, I'm just flying by the seat of my pants and, you know, I'll catch it later. But I had to be more careful. Um, yeah. Yeah, it was, you know, it was, it was, it was more of a challenge than the first book. You know, and I really wanted to hang on to that kind of nostalgic feel. And it, it made me want to write the Edgewood Looking Back book that there, you know, for, for the readers who haven't, you know, seen a galley or, or don't know anything about it yet. And Becoming the Boogeyman interjected in between each chapter. There's either interviews with key players, you know, Joshua Gallagher himself or a prison guard or his a relative or a classmate, that kind of thing. Um, or there's excerpts from a, a, a fictional book called Edgewood Looking Back, which in, by my explanation in the second book, it was spurred by the positive uh, reaction to all the nostalgic, you know, coming of age stuff that I wrote in Ch- Chasing the Boogeyman, which was true. I, I heard from so many people that said, you know, you wrote a serial killer book that had heart and, and nostalgia and it worked. And I'm like, yeah, I have no idea. There was no no plan on my part. It's just the way it needed to be written. Um so I, you know, I knew from the beginning I wanted to do that. In addition to having photos again and stuff, I wanted it to be a different book. And I I was just keep my fingers crossed that it wouldn't come across as too busy and that it would, you know, kind of be seamless. And it would just be like, well, here's a glimpse of, uh, of what made this guy who he is. And now yeah. we're back, to, you know, scary stuff. Um, so yeah, it, it was different challenges, but, uh, but just a lot of fun. I mean, I, both boogeyman books, I, I doubt, you know, other than writing with King and my son, you know, I doubt I'll have that much fun ever writing, you know, books again, just because so much of it is pulled from my real life. And, and I'm able to, re- you know, visit with my family and my parents who are gone. And, you know, I get to write about my friends who, who, who are still in my life, you know, today. And, and that's that's a lot of fun. Most people don't get a chance to do that. Yeah. Yeah. And I mean, I personally refuse to believe that uh, Cheesa Palooza is not real, but uh, <laughs> in terms of the the real life stories that you have uh, incorporated into this story, which one was maybe one of the hardest ones to put down on paper to revisit? Um, before we go, since you mentioned it, I don't know if you can see <laughs> Good. It is real. <laughs> there are some T-shirts, which I got made for, uh, oh, for yeah. a couple of these signings that I'm doing, which, you know, are the T-shirts came out of the book. Um, mm-hmm. <clears throat> but uh, yeah, as far as the most difficult those were in those were in the first book, you know, the the mm-hmm. chasing the boogeyman, writing about myself as a child. Um, you know, there there were two there were two stories in that book um, that I never really that I that are that are one hundred percent true, um, but I'd never written about them before. And for me, they were the equivalent of uh, of in in the novella The Body by Stephen King when he writes about seeing that deer in the morning on the, on the train tracks. And he says, you know, it's this beautiful poetic scene, much more elegant than I could have ever, you know, put it. Um, but at the end, he just simply says, you know, and I, I've never written about it until now. And I think mm-hmm. a lot of writers have those kind of hidden, you know, moments um, that they've kept to themselves and, and they'll either keep them until they're no longer here or they'll decide, okay, the time's right to share it. And, and in Chasing the Boogeyman, there was the moment uh, where my father and I walked up the street and we saw the Christmas lights. 
And there was just that moment of kind of feeling safe and, um, and, and okay. And, and, and happy and just, you know, having those childlike emotions that are so pure, you know, that was one. And, and I've, and I've always remember that and always thought, you know, yeah, maybe one day I'll write about it. And then the big one was uh, in chasing the boogeyman when I was sledding with my friends and they all went home and it was just me in the snow and there was the hush and the, the glow of the house lights and I'm, and I'm there. And, and it, people said, did that really happen? I've, I've spoken you know, many places. And, and that's question has been asked a half dozen times or so. And I'm like, yeah, I was that weird kid, man. It was, it was like, that's why I love the wonder years so much. Cause people were like, Oh, the wonder years was great. But you know, most kids didn't think like Kevin Arnold. And I'm like, yeah, I did. Um, and that was one of those moments where I just thought, wow, you know, it, this is, this is special. And, and it's, this moment's going to pass and everything's mm-hmm. going to pass before we know it, we're all going to be moving away and all the guys I just saw that I just called bad names and they, you know, jumped on my back sliding down the hill and all that stuff. Um, they're going to be gone. And some of them I'm not going to see anymore. And it was just this moment of realizing I was going to grow up and I was going to leave this place. And it was really powerful. And it came hand in hand with, I'm going to write about this. I'm going to write about how I see the world. Um, and I was young, you know, I was, I don't know what I said. I was in the book, but it was accurate, whether it was 12 or 14 or 15 or somewhere in there. Um, but that was a really, it, it came, it pen to paper was really easy. You know, there weren't a lot of polishes done on that section, but it was hard to kind of, you know, right up until the very end, I was like, does it stay? Does it stay? And that was yeah. one of those moments where it was just like, yeah, I, I've got to let it stay. Cause this is the book where I do that. I'm telling yeah. my friend's secrets. I'm telling my own, um, <clears throat> And, uh, and I want the reader to, to really, really get an idea of what Edgewood was to us so he can yeah. understand what this guy invading our, our safety net and our, our whole world as, as, a, as an adolescent was like for us to experience. So, yeah, those, that's a great question because uh, those were the two moments. And in the second book, you know, and, and, and actually in the first book, there was the moment where I was watching, I was looking down the steps and my dad was up getting ready for work. People always mention that one, too. And that was another one. Um, mm-hmm. I, I had never written about it, but I, that one wasn't as difficult. I knew I really wanted to put that in there because of a lot of the interactions with my dad. Um, but yeah, the second book, you know, I don't feel like I gave up as many of those. I gave them all up in the first book. Um, but I still put a lot of, you know, I still put a lot of heart in there and, and, uh, a lot of honesty and, and, um, you know, hopefully that comes across. Yeah, I, I definitely think it does. I mean, the, the way that you write, and intertwining truth and like this, this thriller story that's coming along. It reads honestly like a true crime podcast. Like I can't believe how the style functions. It's wild to me, but it's so funny because I start that book. I read that first section that says, this is fiction. I was still Googling names. (laughs) I guess still looked people up and I was like, this, this has to be real. This person you're talking about has to be real. (laughs) So as someone who, Good, good. I'm glad. And as someone who like toes that line between fact and fiction, what advice do you have to someone that's looking to do the same? Because like, I feel like the way that you write is so unique. And I'm just curious, what advice would you have to someone that's looking to emulate that? Um, You know, I would just say, you know, it, it, it's, 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 that's a, another really good question. And it's, it's, um, I'm stammering because it's, I, I think the way I would approach it with someone who asked me that question would be, you know, don't so much look to, to emulate it, but find the story that in order or actually, or actually, if you want to emulate, if you, you know, you enjoyed the storytelling process so much that you want to try your own hand at it, then you got to find out what's most important to you from your, mm-hmm. your life. And, and I, I talked about this recently to a group and I said, I, I think a good way of doing that would, and I've never done it, so I could be full of it, but I think w- would be journaling. You know, keep yeah. a journal for a while and what you find and just write about anything. It doesn't have to be important. That's the thing. And, and, and I think that's why journaling is 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 a great idea is it doesn't have because I think people who journal and I could be wrong. They don't write about big things all the time. A lot of times it's just about what they had for lunch or what they saw when they were on break at school, you know, or 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 if they're a teacher or a student or whatever. Um but I said, I think if you do that and you write honestly, and that's your goal, so you know, just write honestly every day for a couple months, I think you'll find something, you'll find stories in there. And that's something else I've told people who, you know, say, I've always wanted to be a writer. I write little paragraphs. I write sentences. I write, you know, little sketches here and there. 
but I can't put something cohesive together. And I always say journal, because I think mm-hmm. what you'll find is, is something in there that wants to be expanded. And that's, that's how you're going to find your story. Um, and there's no pressure because it's coming from your life, you know? Yeah. Um, yeah. So I think that's, that'd be a cool way to do it is, is to kind of find that nugget in there and then just run with it. Um, yeah. You know? Yeah. I can see that. And yeah. that that's really good advice. That's one that I, uh, I don't do enough of. <laughs> Yeah. I mean, somebody else asked me, well, you know, have you ever had a writer's block? And I'm like, not really. I, I've had like the kind of writer's block that comes younger you know, just from being intimidated where it's like, Hey, mm-hmm. stop trying to be so perfect and just get to the end. That's the key. Yeah. You know, you're, yeah. you're not Hemingway dude. So stop trying to be this or that and reinvent the wheel just right. And, and I had that, you know, at times as a, at a younger age, but um, yeah, I'm like, I think if you have writer's block and you are someone who's used to having a, a pretty decent output, you know, start journaling. I think that would work. I mean, if, if that's what I plan on doing, if it hits me, you know, I'm knocking on my desk, but, um, you know, I, I just feel like there's nuggets in there to find. And uh, because before that, I put a lot of myself in stories, but uh, I think honestly, 90% of the time, subconsciously, you know, there was, there was no, it, it wasn't until chasing the boogeyman that I thought, okay, I'm writing about me. And, you know, people have thought I ha- I've done it. I've had people say, Hey, that story was about me and you, that story about, was about my brother and me. And I'm like, no, sorry. Um, <laughs> but, uh, but yeah, so, so yeah, I, I've, I've had two books of it now. So yeah, it, it's been fun, but I, I, Again, it, it's a little grueling when you're finished because then you're like, man, I don't want to hear about myself anymore. I don't want to write about myself anymore. And when I got to the end of this book, you know, you kind of alluded to the fact that it, it is open ended. So there's possibly a third. I, I, I had n- no intentions, but I was like, boom, that's just the way it ended. That's what happened. In my mm-hmm. mind, I was like, this is what happened. Um you know, instead of uh, of completely happily ever after, you know, there's this little thing and son of a gun. Now we might have to go back again. And uh, yeah, and we'll see. But um, but yeah, I, I actually told my editor and my agent, I'm like, after this book, I'm not writing about myself anymore. And then I turned it. In. <laughs> yep. Neither one of them yeah. said they lied. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. And I mean, without spoiling the ending at all, there was such perfect like steps leading up to that little tiny hook at the end that it honestly like it didn't feel like a like a shocker as much as like a oh no like i'm ready for this next book to come through so i thought that was really uh well addition so i'm glad that you had that in there (laughs) yeah yeah i Um, uh i i i'm glad you said that too because that's how it felt for me i'm like well you know there's gonna be some readers who and and i've heard from them already from the arcs or from net galley you know um they're like oh my god you know it floored me And then others are felt more like I felt when I was creating it, which was just this sense of, you know, you nod your head. That makes total sense. Son of a gun. Yep. Um, So, yeah, I'm glad you had that reaction. And in Becoming the Boogeyman, because it's set in modern day and because you as the character have released Chasing the Boogeyman in reality and in this story. And there's been documentaries and podcasts and whatnot. Uh, And I know that when you were on this podcast last time with Jay Thorne, uh, you were talking about the potential of some kind of documentary. So is there any chance that we'll see a podcast or a documentary with Chasing the Boogeyman or with this one that you can tell us? (laughs) Yeah. You know what? There's, there still is a possibility, you know, I, uh, I, you know, with the first book, I really wanted my, my oldest son, Billy, Billy, who's, who's a, a really good writer and a, and a filmmaker. And I really wanted him to do that. Um, and, and it became a time issue that we couldn't do it. Uh, I know it made my publisher a little nervous, but I was like, mm-hmm. okay. they'll get over it. <laughs> um, but it just didn't work out. But I, I so badly wanted that to be on the internet for people to find. And yeah. go, Wait a I Googled this and it wasn't true, but what the hell is this? You know, <laughs> nobody would put this much time and money into creating something fake. Um, so now, yeah, you, it, it's kind of evolved into the idea. I would love to do like a six or eight episode podcast, um, which I could be a guest on. And, and, you know, I could bring in several of the <clears throat> same friends or actors who were photographed in the books. So uh, to come and appear and just, just the, the, the different roads that they could take in discussing yeah. these murders and Joshua Gallagher in prison and all of that, you know, somebody could have, uh, well, I corresponded with Joshua Gallagher and this is what he wrote me. Um, so yeah, that's something that I would love to do. And 
I don't have, you know, what I really need is someone to, is someone to come to me and say, Hey, you know, if, if you foot the bill uh, and the bill is reasonable, um, <laughs> I great. And I I'll produce it and, and, you know, we'll, we'll treat it as, you know, with just all these different guests that come on and we can talk about these murders and we can spread it out over, you know, six weeks. And, and uh, you know, cause I think it would help promote the book wonderfully. And I just think it would be, it would, you know, it'd give me that little satisfaction of being able to Blair Witch, play Blair Witch, which is what I wanted yep. to do with the first book. And I couldn't, yeah. um, cause that disclaimer, you know, I probably said it the first time I love my publisher as Schlesinger. My editor is, is top notch. Um, the, the guy is, is brilliant and, and has, has made me so much better and, and is just kind and generous. And, um, but the, yeah, they wouldn't let me. They made sure that that disclaimer <laughs> in there. And I, you know, I remember telling Ed, well, you have to write it because I won't write it. <laughs> and he did. And um, and yeah, and they slapped a novel on the front of the cover. So they stole a little of the thunder there, but it, it worked out <laughs> fine for all of us. And uh, but the podcast would be my chance to kind of play in that in that sandbox again. So I think yeah. it could come. The, the timing would have to be right. And I'd have to find someone who, who wanted to do a decent amount of work and get paid for it, but not a lot and, and make it work. And I just think it'd be so much fun. Agreed. Agreed. And I, I feel like it adds to that extra content. And I mean, the, the images that you have in the book really sell it <laughs> so much. Like that's the reason why I Googled. Um, and I know that uh, from your author notes, like you guys uh, set that up. I think you were um in one of the images you're under a sheet or something oh, like that. Yeah. But I'm just curious, like what, what's the process to craft those images and, and really craft that extra content for the book? Well, what's funny is it, it, it reminds me of, you know, I've done some film stuff, uh, you know, earlier in, in 2000, I guess, 2007 in there. I don't know, but I, I had like a five or six year period where I wrote a lot of scripts and we produced some films and did some in indies and we did some television. My John Sheck, my writing partner and I, um, so it, it was kind of like talking to some of those filmmakers where some of the shots were meticulously planned out and really thought out. And then some of them were just like, Hey, that's perfect. Pull over the car. You get out. You don't have the 35 millimeter then. And you don't have the, the, you know, the, the actual movie camera. So you're just like my cell phone will do <laughs> and, <you take> <laughs> picture, and it ends up working great. Um, yep. So it was, a, it was a little mixture of everything. And then, you know, and then you had your adventure days where you rode, you rode around and you looked for, visuals that matched what you wrote about and in a lot of cases i wrote about you know real places so we just went there and then in some cases the real place didn't you know wasn't quite um you know visual enough to to leave an impression at least in my mind so we had fake it with something else um but yeah it was fun i mean it was it was a lot like you know making a little film um and uh, getting my friends involved and, you know, being able to say, hey, can you do me a favor? Can you go to a thrift store and find something that looks like it, you know, uh, you know, uh, a detective would wear, you know, nowadays, but it, it just can't be too nice and, you know, blah, blah, blah. And then <clears throat> my one buddy's a fire guy, so he's got the badge. And yeah, it was a lot of fun. And Billy and I had fun with it. And in that shot that you talked about with me under the sheet, you know, I was like, <laughs> my entire body was cramping and I'm like, get the duct tape off me, get the duct tape off me. <laughs> Um, so a lot of it, yeah, not nearly as technical as, as I should make it out to be. And, and yeah, just fun. And, and at the same time, you know what it, those photos really did form the thread for me to my true crime, you know, interest in true crime in a lot of those books, because I've I've spoken about it a lot where those photos in the true crime books really have an impact on me. And, and mm -hmm. I'm always quick to point out, you know, we're not talking about bloody, gory, violent photos. Most of the time they're. You know, I talked about this recently, the one shot that just haunted me, which was this patch of grass behind a shed in this suburban neighborhood. And the grass was flattened down and you could see an old can in the weeds. And, and it was where this girl's life ended. And she had everything yeah. in the world in front of her. And I just remember staring at that photo. And I don't even remember which book it's in right now. But I remember staring at the photo. It was those commonplace things that really hit me. And that that so I know while we were taking these photos a lot of times. Um, those feelings would return and it would be instantly kind of a somber mood because it was like, wow, you know, I'm glad we're, we're, we're faking this, but you know, the idea didn't come out of my head. The idea came from, from all my experience with things that really did happen. So, yeah, yeah but with that said, I'm glad you said the photos are what made you Google because that was the plan. <laughs> Don't put them all in one section. Like they are in true crime books. I was like, yeah, I want at the end of every chapter because I, when they read it, I want them to, 
then see the picture. And I want to be there that momentary question of, wait a minute, this is a book. Mm -hmm. This this is make believe. So where the hell did this picture come from? And what do you mean? This is Carly Albright. You know, I thought she was a little different, but they're saying this is Carly. So yeah, that, that was, that was a joyous thing from the first book is just hearing from people who constantly went back and Googled and, the photos messed them up and gave them nightmares. I was like, I was like yeah, behind my desk, <laughs> uh, gleeful about that. Yeah. Yeah. Well, thank you so much for coming on. Um, I will have nightmares, but uh, yeah. I appreciate it. <laughs> no, I appreciate you reading it and, and having me on again. This episode is sponsored by the book marketing experts at Written Word Media. They know that marketing your book can be a challenge and that's why they make marketing simple by providing quick, easy, and effective ways to promote your books. When you schedule a promotion with Written Word Media, your book is emailed to tens of thousands of readers who love your genre. It's exposure that's hard to find any other way. You can even choose a ready-made promo stack that includes multiple promos over a short period of time to help boost your title's rank on retailers like Amazon. The best part? Scheduling your promo only takes five minutes and comes with world-class customer service. Over 30,000 authors trust Written Word Media with their book marketing. See why at writtenwordmedia.com today. So, everybody, uh, Richard (laughs) really focused in on those mannequins for me. So I'm curious, uh, is there anything kind of creepy that you guys focus in on in one of your stories or like fixated on uh, to try and make a creepy point? My wife and I bought a house once that was like that. It was in in Pittsburgh and, you know, it was basically an estate sale. You know, the parents passed away. The kids just sold the house along with everything inside it. And the attic was like there there must have been 15 to 20 mannequins and dolls and all kinds of scary craziness up and up in that attic. Um, no. Yeah, I was I was a very happy camper Burn when, when that dumpster fire. was full and gone. Exactly. <laughs> it, no. It's funny how certain objects like that though evoke that particular response, though, right? Because you know, like you see a mannequin, you walk into Target and there's a mannequin dressed in the latest and greatest by the front door. It doesn't bother you, but you put ten of them in an attic, and you know, you run for that that door. And you know, dolls are the same way, and. Uh, you know, who knows what else, but I know, just remember that episode of Seinfeld with the Elaine mannequin, the mannequin that looked like Elaine <laughs> for you Seinfeld fans out there. That was a good one. <laughs> that was scary. Yeah, I was. remember the eighties movie mannequin. That's what right. a frightening uh, commentary on modern living that turned out to be. <laughs> That's right. I forgot about that. <laughs> I, I, the, the song from Starship just popped into my head. That's, I'm not going to be able to get that out. My... Nothing's going to stop never... you now, JD. No, nothing's going to stop us You're welcome now. for the earworm, America. Uh-huh. <laughs> uh, another thing about uh, Becoming the Boogeyman is that it was basically an unintentional sequel. Chasing the Boogeyman was going to be the, the one and done, and then one day, uh, Richard was like, hey, I got an idea and I want to keep rolling with it. Many of you had uh, a story that you've written, felt like you've reached a concluding point, And then months, yeah. weeks, years later, you're like, I got a sequel and you need to jump to the page. Yeah, I have. Uh, so I wrote a book called Evergreen. It's the one that I it's, it's kind of apocryphal. I tell I tell people about writing that, that I wrote that a 60,000 word draft of that in one day <sighs> while I was in Manhattan. And, uh, and that was the last time I'll ever do it. That was an experiment, but I did it. Uh, and it turned out to be one of my most popular books. And so for years, I always considered that a one and done, but for years, people were pestering me for a sequel to it. And, uh, I kind of resisted until one day I, I wrote another, I wrote a novella that was a crossover between two of my main series. And in it, I made this like casual, very, very super casual mention of something from evergreen. And it sparked an idea for a sequel, which I, I wrote a few months ago. Um, and that one I wrote in, in 10 days, not one day. But I was able to get that book written and out. And, and it had the same sort of vibe as the first. But yeah, so that that's the only time I've written a sequel to a book that I thought was done. How did that feel like going back into that world, though? Like, what was that process for you? What did that look like? I slipped right back into it. That's what really got me. I, I, it was, it was almost like I hadn't left. Like I could have, you could have potentially fooled me into thinking I, I just, it, you know, wrote the end in the first book and immediately started writing the second. I just, the characters were there. The, the nuances of their interactions were there. It's a, it's a very odd 
scenario, the guy uh, can absorb people's personalities by touching them skin to skin. And so he has conversations with this group that's become permanently lodged in his head. And all those characters were just back and their interactions were back. And uh, it just, the story kind of just, it was one of those, you know, most of my stories end up sort of writing themselves by the time it's all over. But this, this one really flowed. It just, uh, I knew what had to happen. I knew which characters uh, mattered for the story. Uh, and I knew which questions I needed to answer. It was, it, it flowed very well. It's speaking of having that like flow or that going back to things and, and having those words flow, uh, Richard, when he talks about like running into those writing blocks or, or blocks in process, he'll jump into journaling or something that still includes writing, but it's not necessarily writing on the piece that they, they're working on. Uh, do you guys do anything like that uh, where you still write? It's just not necessarily the project you're working on. And what is that? I used to journal when I was a kid, and I, I think that helped hone a voice on on some level. Um, you know, I was always very quiet. Like I, you know, I could go a whole day without speaking to to somebody unless I had to. Um, and it, it, teachers at the time just encouraged me to you know start a journal, write write things down. Um, and I, I think that's where I really got a you know kind of a love for just the the written word and and kind of found a, a voice. Richard takes it to a, a whole other level. And I remember, I mean, this goes back now a couple of years, but like when he sent uh, Chasing the Boogeyman, the first book in this series, to me, I, I literally got to like ninety percent of that book, you know, thinking that it was a true story. I was like, holy crap! I didn't <laughs> know Rich chased down a serial killer. This is this is fantastic. Um, just the, the way that it's written. Like I, 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 he may have created a new format with that. Like I, I, I don't yeah. know if any other books out there in that particular format. Um, and he carries it through in, in this one so, you know, so well, you know, because he basically plays out the story, you know, with fictional Richard Chismar, you know, being told by real Richard Chismar, you know, and the movie that happened and this happened and that happened, and it, it's just it's such a cool vibe and just refreshing to to read something yeah. different. You know, totally agree. And. With that, when when you're talking about like how he blurs those lines between fact and fiction, I mean, in my writing, it's all fictional. I'm pretty straightforward there. But in your guys's, do you do you blend the line between fact and fiction, and like how much do you lean into that uh, in your writing? We did it quite a bit in Dracul, you know, mainly because we were using Bram Stoker's actual journal. So, you know, like like we were just talking about journaling, like he actually kept a journal. Um, so we lifted things from that and and threw them into the fictional world, which does make it fun, I think, from a reader standpoint. And you kind of touched on this in the interview. You know, you, you jump on Google, you know, like you read something like, oh, I got to mm -hmm. check that out for myself and you jump on Google and actually find, you know, that it's true or, or yeah. whatever. Um, it adds a, a whole other dynamic. I did Google Jesus Palooza. It exists in Wisconsin. Jesus Palooza. Did you get a t-shirt, JV? Did you get a Jesus Palooza t-shirt? No, no, I want one. <laughs> <laughs> I uh, because a lot of my books are archaeological thrillers, and uh, one of the tricks I learned early on was, you know, instead of me do, trying to cram a ton of research in and for each book and trying to make sure I get all the details right, was I would I would go deep dive like one particular subject, open with discussing that, but tan go off on a tangent on on a related quote unquote thing that I completely made up, and. Uh, and and I'd run with that, and that would become the point of the story. So people would get that little fact that everyone who reads these things wants, uh, the real history stuff, and then the rest was all made up. What's been surprising to me, even kind of alarming to me sometimes, is that occasionally I get email from someone who says, yeah, you know, I didn't have any idea about that until you, until I read your book. And then I went and Googled it and it's amazing. All this stuff, you know, I'm like, where did this come from? Like, why did I, <laughs> how did, is it, is it real because I wrote it or did I read it somewhere? So that's, that, that's been an interesting experience. <laughs> <laughs> well, that kind of plays into something else that he mentioned, right? He, you guys have talked about the documentary that he wants to make. Mm -hmm. um, mm -hmm. You know, like, is is it worth it as an author to create some of these third, you know, party type entities and just put them out there in the world, you know, create a, a YouTube something, you know, create a fictitious web page, yeah. create things for the readers to stumble into? I mean, honestly, I think it is. I think it, it just turns the whole thing into this interactive experience that, you know, a book normally isn't, um, which just makes it a little bit more fun. Have you done that or with any of your works? 
I mean, if, for for me, the closest I've done is you know, like Dad McAllister, which Christine pointed out, um, is a fictitious writer. He's in Forsaken. He's you know, his books. Have, he dies at the end. Spoiler alert! Um, but his books have popped up in a lot of my other novels. I've got characters reading them and things like that. Um, if you were to Google him, he's got his own web page. He's got his own book covers out there. His own <laughs> bio. Um, you know, which I did for that that same reason. It just kind of kind of kept it fun. I did some interviews with some of my protagonists and uh, with them sitting in a room with me talking to me about um, their lives and about the history and that sort of thing. Uh, I, I just did that. Uh, actually, what the time I did it was actually the first time I ever met JD uh, when we were in Tennessee for that conference and I needed some material for my newsletter. So I wrote over the, past, the next couple of days, I wrote interviews and the only thing that the readers did not like about that, they loved them, uh, it, but they wanted them to be longer. So I'm mm -hmm. now considering you know, going and adding additional material and putting them on Substack or something. That's a great idea for, for reader magnets, right? Yeah. That's a real good idea for reader magnets for sure. Yeah. So JD, who's up next week? Next week, we've got New York Times bestseller Andrew Child coming back. He's going to tell us about the latest Jack Reacher novel. It's called The Secret and releases October 24th. Sounds great. If you'd like to be notified as soon as new episodes publish, make sure you go to writersincpodcast.com and sign up now. We'll see you next episode and have a great week of writing. Thanks for listening to this episode of Writers Inc. Access the show notes and leave a comment at writersincpodcast.com.